Welcome to the Registers Report. My name is John Buckley. I'm the Register of Deeds of Plymouth County. This show is about Plymouth County real estate. Our headline for the month was Slow Trends in Real Estate Continue. Um, I'm going to have, have reporting the numbers. I have a great guest in the second segment of the show, Matthew Rollo, a mortgage loan officer at Style Mortgage, talking about the process for receiving a pre-authorization or pre-approval letter. And we're going to talk about some of our great colony and county history. So let's go right to the numbers. So in terms of sales of property for the month of August, this show is being taped in September. There are 875 deeds recorded in August, more than the 802 in July, second highest in the calendar year, but 15% lower than last year, um, recorded in August 2021. Year to date, we're down about 13% in terms of sales of property. You're going to see a listing of all deeds in unit deeds, meaning condos, uh, for those 27 communities of Plymouth County, from Abington to Whitman. Uh, you'll notice on that chart for each of those months through August, Plymouth and Brockton are the largest number of sales. Uh, however, every one of our 27 communities, very diverse communities, have had sales of property. Uh, the, the biggest issue we've had as of late is a significant drop in our documents. Uh, and of course, with mortgages, when the rates went up, refinancing stopped, period. Uh, there were 1,617 mortgages recorded in August, more than the 1,578 in July, but 46% lower than the 3,020 of August in 2021. We had some boom years during COVID, believe it or not, but once the rates went up, things have gone down. Year to date in mortgages, we're down 44%, which is significant. We've always followed foreclosures since the crisis in 2008. However, there was a moratorium in place during the real difficult COVID times, so that only nine foreclosure deeds were recorded in August. A foreclosure deed is when a lender is taken back a property from someone usually for failure to pay. Uh, more than the seven in July, but 125% more then the four in August of 21, again, there was a moratorium in place. And yet a date up 52%. But more closely than deeds, we watch foreclosure notices because those are the precursor to a foreclosure deed. So if you find yourself in trouble, reach out to a federal housing council as fast as you can. The earlier you get on that issue, if you lost your job, if you have medical issues that are costing you money from keeping you from paying your mortgage, don't hesitate, get right on it. There were 49 foreclosure notices in August, more than the 39 in July, 360% more, again, because of the moratorium than August 21. And uh, there have been mortgages, I'm sorry, foreclosures in orders and notice uh, in some communities, but because of the moratorium, uh, there were a lot of zeros there. Please be aware that we offer a free fraud alert at the registry. Go to our website, PlymouthDeeds.org. Go to resources. Go to the fraud alert. If you enter your email, any recording against you, you'll get an email. So you'll know what's going on with your property. Maybe it's something that is good. Maybe it's a mortgage discharge that shows you paid off your mortgage. But you certainly want to be vigilant and aware what's going on with your property. I have a great guest coming on the second segment of the show, Matthew Rollo, a mortgage loan officer at Style Mortgage. We'll be discussing the importance uh, for, in process for receiving a pre-approval, pre-authorization letter. So we'll see you in the next segment. Welcome back to the Registers Report. My name is John Buckley. I'm the Register of Deeds of Plymouth County. In this segment of the show, we always do something educational in nature. We've had surveyors, appraisers, commercial real estate brokers, a lot of realtors, 
I have a great guest here with me today. I have Matt Rollo, a mortgage loan officer with Style Mortgage. Welcome. Matt. Thank you. Thank you for having me. And uh, Matt is a first time guest. So before we talk about the importance in the process of receiving a pre approval, pre authorization letter, mm -hmm. Let's talk a little bit about how you got into the real estate business. Yeah, sure. So I've been in financial services for 30 years. Um, I got into this business, uh, the loans business, about five years ago. Um, it's been the best, most rewarding financial service job I've ever had because um, you're helping someone either, you know, reconnoiter their finances or get a home, which is it's, mm -hmm. it's important. Um, Part of American culture and who we are as Americans, right? Um, so I find it extremely rewarding. You know, it's it's been a great great job to, that's, to do. That's great. Yeah. So let's talk a little bit about Style Mortgage. Yep. Where were you based and how do you so, operate? So Style is um, a brokerage that's affiliated with uh, Bristol County Savings. Okay. Um, most people were familiar with them in this market, and they um, they started um, I think last year. As, a, as an ancillary to their, their banking products. Um, being a brokerage, it gives them more leverage to do different products right. um, as, a, as a mortgage broker. And we cover uh, Massachusetts, Rhode Island, New Hampshire, Connecticut. Wow, yep. big service yeah. era. Yep. So uh, we talked a little bit in advance, mm -hmm. and I know I'm gonna get a little education in myself yeah. about the importance in the process of receiving I always called it a pre-approval letter. Sure, yeah. You're going to make a little distinction. Yeah, yeah. Now so, you, how would someone out there, you know, watching our show, um, go about that? Yeah. So th the distinction is important to make. You know, I mean, it's basically the process by which a, a lender, um, you know, would vet you to to see what you you qualify for. Mm -hmm. But there's 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 a pre-qualification, there's a pre-approval, and they are used interchangeably with realtors and brokers and um, and, and, and lenders in general, but um, a pre-qualification really is a general, is generally means that a, a borrower or a client has completed an application, um, pulled their credit, um, and we take that information and we run that up against uh, the Fannie and, and Freddie uh, guidelines to determine if you'd qualify for this loan scenario that you're looking to do. Um, it's not a commitment, it's, it hasn't been approved, um, it can be used in the marketplace. Um, it's a good place to start. We will give you a letter, but at the top of the letter, it does say the distinction is that this isn't a loan commitment. Um, so, like I said, it's a good place to start, but it's not as um, strong or committed as what we call pre-approval. Okay. So pre-approval is we take that process that I just mentioned, mm -hmm. and now we take whatever the documentation is being requested, usually it's like your W-2s, your income information, pay stubs, assets, and we send it into an underwriter, and an underwriter will go through that and approve you based on the, the loan scenario that you've requested. Okay. And so you will get a letter saying you, you've received a, a loan commitment. It's a conditional commitment because we still need the property because um, the property mm -hmm. you know, securitizes mm -hmm. the loan. So, right. so that's the distinction between the two. Right. So how do you typically uh, have someone approach you? Um, how do they find you? Yeah. Well, they can find me a variety of ways. Either a lot of times they get referred through brokers, which mm -hmm. is which is a very uh, common way. Um, we have an internet uh, website and Google search. They can search us. Mm -hmm. There's a there's a variety of ways. Um, clients I've worked with in the past, I, I tend to keep in touch with and reach out, um, see how they're doing, and you know. Lo and behold, hey, yeah, we're going to buy a we're going to buy a, a vacation property in the Cape. Okay, mm -hmm. great, let's talk. So, mm -hmm. but it is important um, to talk with a professional lender um, because you know you, you need to figure out where you stand. Mm -hmm. The worst thing you can do is go in and, and find that beautiful home that you love and find out you can't afford, can't afford it. Right? It, right? That's right. A, that's a that's a kick in the gut. So you don't want to do that. You want to really. Um, work with a with a lending professional, and especially you might qualify for certain programs. Mass Housing has a has a plethora of programs right. that we can see if you qualify for, right. or there are certain um, arrangements or certain you know types of products that might make more sense. Like if you're going to be in a home for a short period of time, maybe you do an adjustable rate mortgage versus a fix because the rate might be better. So there's all kinds of different um, scenarios and products that we can walk you through that can get you help you make the best decision. So someone out there watching you on this mm -hmm. show, yeah. what would you tell them to 
to be able to gather together in preparation of approaching someone like you. Yeah, you want to have good executive <clears throat> functionality, right? You right. want to be organized. So um, you definitely want, if you're a W-2 employee, you definitely want to have you know, your pay stubs, your W-2s in order, um, your asset statements. A lot of those things, um, depending on the lender, a lot of that stuff, we're in, we're in such an electronic portable world, a lot of those things can be electronically ported, mm -hmm. ported in. But, but have that, that file together. Um, you know, lenders are going to ask questions about large deposits. You know, if you have a lot of Venmo going out of your bank account, they're mm -hmm. going to ask that because they're trying to determine if there's other debt that isn't showing up on your credit report. Um, people are afraid to have their credit pulled because they think it, it impacts their credit. Um, it does. The CFPB has a website that can tell you about, what, you know, what impacts your credit on hard pulls and so forth. But at the end of the day, you should have a professional lender like myself pull your credit because sometimes um, we find things that you might not even looked at. But you can actually pull your credit yourself. The, the, the law says that you can get one free credit uh, statement every year. And so it's a good thing to maybe pull it yourself and take a look to see if there's anything on there that you don't recognize before mm -hmm. a lender gets a hold of it. Maybe you can rectify it, or, or mm -hmm. you know, maybe there's a, a medical payment or something that wasn't paid. The underwriters might want to see that paid. So it's a, that's a good exercise too, okay. is to look at your credit. And what companies are those that primarily people go to it's, on their own? Uh, yeah, TransUnion, Equifax, and um, and um, I'm, I'm having a blank on the last one. TransUnion, Equifax, and um, okay. so uh, if, they can, if they go Experian, Experian, oh, okay. it's a third they, one. They, yeah. they can. Yeah. Experience. Find them on Google and yeah. just go right to them. Yeah, that. you can go right right to those three. The CFPB, like I said, the Consumer um, um, Financial um, website is a good good place to go because um, that gives you a lot of information about you know fair lending acts and things like that. So so once they meet with you, mm -hmm. once they provide all that information, um, a letter is generated. Well, the first place we'll start is I'll ask them to fill out an application. Okay, okay so we'll ask them to go online and. And put all their information okay. in. Okay. And, and a loan application. Yeah, a loan application. It's affectionately known as the unify, uh, uh, uniform residential loan application. Okay. And it's it. Most every lender has it. Uh, some kind of electronic version. You go online and do it, and it populates it for me. And it's really important to um, put as much descriptive information on there as you can. Your assets, your income, your work history, your 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 your, your living history, so we can determine. We can provide you. You know, a, a proper you know, qualification. We, we don't want any surprises when an underwriter gets it. We want to mm -hmm. kind of look at that and vet that up front. Um, that's the first step. And then, you know, we'll pull your credit and then we will, you know, look at the, um, it's called the DU, but it's the FANI um, regulation guidelines. We'll look at that against your information to see what we think you can qualify for based on various scenarios too. And we'll provide various scenarios to you loan scenarios and products that, that best meet, meet your needs. Like I say, people are very afraid of adjustable rate mortgages, but if you think you're only gonna be in the home for a short period of time, um, adjustable rate might be better than a fix because the rate might be lower. So there's, there's different things that we can look at to help you make the best decision. Yeah, we've gone through, in, in my time, we've mm -hmm. gone through some crazy times. I was yeah. there during the 2003, 2004, yeah. multiple refinance efforts yeah. The crash that we talked about earlier yeah. of 2008. Yeah. yeah. And um, we're, we're having some trouble this time. It seems a little different because people this time around seem to have equity yeah. in, in their property, whereas yeah. in 2008, everyone was underwater. Yeah. And I think also with the Dodd-Frank rules um, mm -hmm. are much stronger than they were, they were previous to, right. to that. And I, I, you know, back then when people started defaulting, when they opened up the packages and started to see that some of these people didn't even qualify for loans, mm -hmm. I, would, I don't think you'd see that today because I think that the the, um, the the loans are much much more qualified based on the rules and the regulations. Yeah, thankfully, so, right, yeah, right. thankfully, yeah. Right. So that's right. a good thing. And and yeah, like you said, I think people have been sitting on a ton of equity. Mm -hmm. um, so I think we're in a better place in, in in that regard, in terms of you know the the potential default, you know. So, so your letter would issue a maximum lending amount, or how would that work? Yeah. So, what, and we, when we do the application, if we're, you know, a pre-qualification letter would just be simply me gathering the information, looking at your income and your assets, and and um, running it against the the guidelines, and we'd issue a letter, and that's a letter saying that, you know, based on this information, you would probably qualify for for, you know. Uh, 
uh, a $400,000 loan based on a $500,000 purchase, 30-year fixed at some rate. Um, a pre-approval, like I said, goes to the underwriter, and that letter, once the underwriter approves that, they would issue a letter saying, you received, congratulations, you've received a conditional approval um, for this amount and this rate and its conditions, and, the, and they, we would outline the conditions below, meaning, you know, as long as the financials don't change, as long as, you know, we we'll need a property to, for final approval. Um, but that has a little more teeth because now an underwriter has, has committed to it. A bank has, has given you a commitment to a certain amount. And, you know, quite frankly, in the marketplace, you're just below a cash borrower, mm -hmm. you know, so you're, you're very competitive in the marketplace with that yeah. kind of letter. Certainly, we're, we're coming out of a little bit of that yeah. problem, the multiple bidding, yeah. overbidding yeah. issue and yeah. cash over lending. Yeah, it seems to slow down yeah. a little bit. Yeah, that's, that's good. It's a good sign. Yeah, so, so a um, seller Mm -hmm. or the seller's realtor yep. would look at that pre-approval letter yep. and see that they are a strong buyer yeah. as part of putting a potential offer together for that person. Yeah, I mean, I'll just tell you a quick story just to illustrate the difference in that. You know, I, had a, I had a buyer that was 10% uh, down, um, and, but they were approved for the loan amount. Um, so we had 100% financing, you know, all set up. The realtor, the, the, bar, the customer's buying agent calls me up and says they lost out. They're, they, they're getting an offer from someone with 30% down, they're going to go with them. I said, well, let me ask you a question. They have 30% down, do they have the other 70% settled with a bank? I'm like, I don't know. Can you talk to the listing agent? So I explained to the listing agent. Listing agent called me back and says, no, they haven't, they, they haven't even filled out an application with the bank yet. <laughs> wow. I said, well, then... They're not ready to go. My person's ready to go. We just need an appraisal, get the title um, straightened around, and we're ready to close the loan. And so they, they came back to, uh, to my buyer and gave well, them pretty, the accepted that's offer. That's pretty interesting. Yeah. So it's good to have your, your lending professional. You know, we work closely with the realtors sure. to have those conversations. So we won that deal for that so, for a buyer. So the realtor for the buyer was, was the advocate that turned that around? No, actually I was. Because <laughs> <laughs> <Okay>. he... <laughs> He wanted me to call the listing agent, and I spoke to the listing agent, which is the sellers, yeah. you know, representing right, the sellers. And right. I said, "This is, you know." Oh, that's great. And they went back to the to the to the, the person making that offer with thirty oh, percent down, and found out that yeah, we got to go to the we're going to the bank tomorrow. I'm like, there, oh, are, wait a lot, a there are a lot of people crushed in this process we're going yeah. through right now. Yeah, and that's such why such a low inventory, yeah. and so competitive still. And you know, on paper, you're like, well, that person's got thirty yeah, percent down, right. and this person's got ten percent down, well, so they're not a strong buyer. Well. That's not true. Yeah, that's an you interesting know? story. So that's why it's important for you to work closer with your lenders and your realtors, and, and right. we, we advocated for them and got that deal done. So I've had some conversations with people because of the um, rising rates mm -hmm. that a, a um, you know early you know short term what do you call it, not a modification what for the, for the loan mm -hmm. is better now than a thirty year fixed. Um, you mean like a, um, um, like, like a, an adjustable, you mean? Yeah, three-year yeah. adjustable, five-year yeah. adjustable. Maybe yeah, it, right it can be. Um, you know, so how, how they work is, you know, you'll see what they call a 5-1 arm, a 7-1 arm, or a 10-1 yeah. arm. Um, and some of them now, the banks are switching over to a different index, so you'll see like a 5-6 or a 10-6 or a 7-6. The, the first number is the number of years that loan is fixed. The okay. second number is the period on, on which it okay. changes. So a 5-1-R means that it's fixed for the first five years, and then every year after that, it will change, the rate will change. A 5-6 means it's fixed for the first five years, and every six months the rate okay. changes. Um, it can be, and like I said at the beginning, it can be a better situation if that you're moving to another city you're from Boston, and you're doing, you know, a corporate gig for a few years yeah. in Washington. Um, you might want to look at a seven-one arm versus a fix because a seven-one arm, the first seven years, that rate might be lower mm -hmm. than what its thirty-year, you know, loan might be. It, those the the adjustable rate mortgages are thirty-year note, but the first period is a certain first period that it's fixed and so I've seen that um, where sometimes you know a, a, a 30 year fix might be five and a half where the 
seven one arm might be like four and three quarters. Mm -hmm. So that so it's always good to look at that. Yeah. I think people get nervous about. Oh, I don't want an adjustable. No, rate. certainly advice yeah. has been don't do an adjustable. Yeah. When when you were able to get a three yeah. percent. Yeah. Thirty year. Yeah. Um, but I'm also told there may be some programs out there that it is adjustable for three or five years, and then there's a cap on what the next. Yeah. One can so be. that's the nice thing about what you'll see on adjustable rates now. Um, they're hybrids because they do have caps within okay. the period yes. and they have caps in the life of the loan. So a lot of times you'll see, um, so let's just say like, um, say a, an adjustable rate starts out at, at 5%, right? Um, they'll, and they'll have, they'll explain to you it's a 225, um, 5 one arm. What does that mean? So the first number means that um, it's going to have a 2% cap within the periods. Mm -hmm. So every year, if the rate is, if one period the rate's 4%, the highest it can go is 6%. So okay. that protects you on the, on, on the inter-period adjustment. Yeah. Um, the second number is when it comes out of uh, um, the fixed period, it can only go up a certain amount. Mm -hmm. And then the last number is the life of the loan, 5% plus whatever the first fixed period was, if it was 5.5% plus the 5%, the life alone can never go exceed 10.5%. Okay. So there's some protections. Yeah. And it's good to talk to your, your lending professional about what that means and what the protections are because you know, back in the 70s and 80s, they, they didn't have those caps and mm -hmm. people were paying right, like right, 19%. Right. Well, I remember 14 and 18%. Yeah, so. Interesting. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. So. Um, so that so that's a great option. Yeah, it is a good option, particularly yeah. people that are really uh, disenchanted. Yeah, by, I'm started looking for a home. I get rejected a couple times, yeah. and I still want to buy a home. Yeah, but now the rates have gone up, and how does that affect me? Yeah, some people were qualified at a three and a half percent interest rate, and by the spring, they couldn't get that loan that they were they were originally looking at because the rate got so high it, it disqualified them. So we had to adjust their loan amounts. Oh, right. So that and, and you know. By adjusting a loan amount, you're adjusting the purchase amount, but your purchase amount is ability is dropping here, but the market is going here. So right. a lot of people got priced out of the market, yeah. unfortunately. So the so the bottom line is, um, when you meet with someone like you, mm -hmm. you explain their options. Obviously, yep. the first thing they need to do is prove that they're qualified yeah. to borrow. Yeah. And um, getting that number, and then yeah. once that number is established, there are various ways to fund it once they're at that final point. Yeah, yeah, You'd, and, and like I said, a lot of people were very reticent to do an application or to pull their credit, but you really need to do that. Right. Um, so how do, I know we're, we're kind of running out of time. Mm -hmm. How does that, that credit report affect their credit? Um, it, it, on a hard inquiry poll, it, it does impact uh, the score. Okay. Um, I, I, I can't pretend to know what that, yeah, that no, algorithm is because they keep that as trade out. secrets. But yeah. but when you pull successive reports, there it, it doesn't impact you, and the CFPB website explains okay. that because it, they do allow you to rate shop. Wow. So so it, it, it does uh, it won't impact further credit polls. So so Matt, you're very knowledgeable about <laughs> your business. We get into way far deep into the weeds. Oh, well, and I, I, and I sorry about that. No, I think that's great. <laughs> okay, good. So good. can you just share your contact information yeah, with so our viewers? I'm, um, I'm with Style Mortgage, and the best way to reach me is my phone number, 617-910-6635. You can call or text me. Um, I answer to both. And I, you know, like a realtor, I'm working Monday to Sunday. And right. we, we can help people after hours because I know people work. So You've been a great guest. I always right. love it when I learn something. Yes, that's awesome. I'm glad you learned something. <laughs> great. Thanks, Matt. All right. Thank you. you. It's a pleasure. Welcome back to the Registered Report. My name is John Buckley. I'm the Register of Deeds of Plymouth County. I want to thank Matt Rolla for the great job he did at describing a pre-authorization, pre-approval process. Um, it, it is something that everyone has to do now. Most realtors won't even talk to you if you don't have that in advance of discussing what you might do going forward. Uh, the holidays for the month, Labor Day has gone by. Beer Lovers Day was the seventh. Um, that's gone by. Uh, Oktoberfest on the 17th has gone by today. Uh, tonight actually begins fall. Uh, the autumnal equinox. Uh, going forward, there's National Chocolate Milk Day, National Coffee Day at the end of the month, and we're going to talk about a couple of our 
notable land records from Plymouth County uh, deeds. Uh, one is a fellow by the name of Billy McGonagall. I did talk about him before, but because we're coming to the end of a baseball season uh, and we're going to get into the October uh, World Series and the process that gets there, and the Los Angeles Dodgers are the best team in baseball, I want to bring forward Billy McGonagall again. He was a son of Irish immigrants. He was a pioneer in the development of professional baseball. He was a Brockton shoe worker that played on minor league teams back in those days. They did not use gloves. Uh, catchers in particular were having broken fingers as the ball got tighter and tighter. He started using bricklayers gloves, um, which deadened the impact of the ball. It certainly began, began the development of the catcher's mitt and other gloves. While playing um, in a baseball game in 1885, his he was, had a fractured skull from getting hit in the head by a pitch and became a manager. He became a manager of the Brooklyn Bridegrooms. Uh, that year, a lot of them got married, so that was the name of the team. But they won the American Association title. Uh, next year, they transferred into the National League, and they won the National League. He's the only manager that managed back-to-back championships in two different leagues, and they became the Los Angeles Dodgers. So the Los Angeles Dodgers name came from those people dodging the streetcars in Brooklyn, New York. But he's a very well-known individual within the a Dodger organization. If you're rooting for the Dodgers for another pennant, you can think about Billy McGonagall. The next person I'm gonna talk about is a football player uh, many people don't remember the Patriots before Tom Brady, and everyone certainly mentions Tom Brady every time they talk about the Patriots now. But the quarterback before Tom Brady was Drew Bledsoe. He lived in Bridgewater, and he was a great quarterback. He was the number one pick in the 1993 draft, and he helped the Patriots earn their first Super Bowl appearance in eight years. Uh, he, he appeared in the Pro Bowl. After his years with the Patriots, he went on to play with the Buffalo Bills. He is in the Patriots Hall of Fame, and he has run various ventures. Um, last but not least, in the county records, I advise you on a fall day to go to the Albert Norris Reservation. It's in the town of Norwell. It's a walking path that leads down to the North River. Beautiful in the fall. It was donated by Eleanor Norris and named after her husband. Um, again, right near Nowell Center. And last but not least, one of our Plymouth Colony records. So our Plymouth Colony records go back to 1620 based on the arrival of the Mayflower. This particular record is from 1642. All of the areas around Plymouth uh, in the surrounding towns had problems with wolves. Uh, so they assigned each town to have five wolf traps in the towns of Bonstable, um, Yarmouth, which were part of Plymouth Colony, Marshfield, and others. It just shows you how the more things change, the more they remain the same, because in many communities now we're having trouble with coyotes, and they haven't gone to that length to take care of the coyotes, but certainly back in those days, they were very scared of wolves and made those decisions. I want to thank Rock and Cable Access for running this show, particularly Emma Rannan and Athena Grant from the show here today, Luna Green Baker and Christine Richards from my office. This is my 143rd show at Brockton Cable Access. I share this with local providers throughout Plymouth County and provide information to people about for what for most people is their most valuable asset. So have a great fall. I'll see you next month.